right. Hi, everybody. This is Alex Reynolds. I am a neurointensivist at Mount Sinai Hospital, and I am here to host uh, one of the Hot Topics podcasts for Neurocritical Care Society. And on these Hot Topics podcasts, we're going to be discussing what's new and now in neurocritical care. So with me today, I have uh, Matt Jaffa, who is a neurointensivist at Hartford and co-founder and associate director of the Neuro Recovery Clinic. And I also have Rich Choi, the medical director at Christiana Care and vice chair of our very own ethics committee of Neurocritical Care Society. And we'll be speaking today about normothermic regional perfusion and why neurointensivists should know and care about it. Uh, I thought I would start by asking you, Rich, to do a basic introduction of what normothermic regional perfusion or NRP is. Sure. So um, in order to talk about NRP, I think that we need to talk about heart transplantation in general. And historically, as you all know, this is typically something that has been done after brain death. That is one of the few ways in which we obtain hearts. And that largely has to do with the period of warm ischemia that ensues any period of a DCD donation, which is donation after circulatory death. And so because of the ongoing need for hearts and the ongoing need for um, uh, in the, an attempt to increase the number of available organs, there are now two different mechanisms by which we can obtain hearts after DCD. And one of them is normothermic regional perfusion. So in normothermic regional perfusion and specifically thoracoabdominal normothermic regional perfusion, what occurs is that after the patient is declared, usually in the operating room, the chest cavity is then opened up and the great vessels are cannulated after which ECMO is started. Usually, in most cases, after this is done, the heart starts beating, and after about five more minutes, the ECMO circuit is then shut down. And so what ensues is that once the heart is restarted, they can assess the mechanical function of it, and they can assess whether or not it's a good organ for transplant. And then after that, if they determine that if this is a viable transplant organ, then that organ is procured, placed on ice, and then quickly transferred to the recipient. So that's great. And I'm wondering, um, why has this come about? And maybe we can review some data on whether there's an actual improvement in quality of organs uh, when they're obtained this way. Um, and is there a cost differential? Sure. So. The only other way to obtain organs after a DCD is through what is called a direct procurement and perfusion procedure. So in this procedure, immediately after the declaration of death, during a donation after a circulatory death donation, the heart is very quickly um, procured from the patient and is placed into this perfusion device, which is, um, there's only one in the market right now. It's called the OCS and it's made by Transmedics. And this is a perfusion device that they then cannulate the heart and it can also uh, restart it, but they're not able to assess an in situ function of it. The other problem with direct procurement is that there's a great cost associated largely because of the cost of this device, which costs almost $300,000. And then there's this an associated cost of about $70,000 for each individual case. Um, the other benefits of TANRP, um, which is thoracoabdominal NRP, as opposed to the direct procurement, um, is that the machine, the OCS device, is only made to handle adult hearts. And so, for example, you couldn't use it for uh, PEATS or baby um, heart transplants. Um, in terms of outcome data, there's now several groups that have published on both TANRP as well as direct procurement and perfusion, and they have shown that the outcomes with regards to um, the function of the heart after it's transplanted as well as one-year survival is very, very similar to hearts that are obtained after donation after brain death. So that brings up an interesting question because it's very clear why neurologists should care about brain death, but... Why should neurologists care about NRP when we're talking about patients who have died because of withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies? So it's a, a really great question. And I think that um, in part, what this comes down to is really thinking about 
uh, how do we define death and, and how does NRP differentiate from taking an organ from a patient who is a DCD um, or death by circulatory uh, criteria? And so when we think about death, we think about the UDDA um, as the law for how we define death. And, and as most know, or everyone should know, death is defined as irreversible cessation of circulatory or respiratory function, or the irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain and brainstem in most, uh, in most countries. Um, and this is, I think most people are also aware, is actively being discussed um, to determine if there are needs for changes in this, um, in this definition of death, which becomes important here because when we're talking about irreversibility, when the concept of NRP suggests that potentially this is not an irreversible uh, cause of, of death, that we're restarting a patient's heart or a person's heart after it has been determined to be irreversibly um, stopped. Uh, and what I would add to that is that, uh, and I had forgot to mention before, is that during the TA NRP procedure, once the chest is opened, the cerebral vessels are ligated or clamped in order to ensure that there's no circulation to the brain. And so that also uh, leads to this question of whether or not if, as Matt is saying, based on UDDA criteria, the patient is the, the patient's reason for why they were declared dead is no longer valid, then is clamping of the cerebral vessels problematic as it is potentially inducing brain death? And I'm glad that you said that because I've spoken to some people not in the medical field about this uh, procedure. And the immediate feeling that most people have is that you're performing resuscitation of a patient, you know, and, and we do do this, right, with, you know, ECMO CPR. And then the difference is that a surgeon is tying off the vessels to the brain and therefore inducing brain death. And so can you sort of switch your declaration from cardiac death to brain death um, after after declaring death, and I think I think that's one of the first sort of impulses that people have when they hear about the active act by a surgeon of tying off vessels. What are what are your thoughts about that? Well, I would start by saying is that proponents of TANRP, what they argue is based on a council that was formed in 2008, and that was um, organized by, uh, by the President's Council on Bioethics. And what they were doing is just exploring the justifications that you can use to uh, define brain death or human death as part of, 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 of human death. And so the concept that the majority of this council arrived at is that death, rather than being an irreversible process in a, is a permanent termination of brain function. And so they came upon this concept called the unifying medical concept of death, where uh, in essence, death is not one or the other, but rather the ongoing absence of brain function. And so proponents of TA and RP will argue that because the patient is now declared based on circulatory criteria, but because there is still an absence of brain flow after these vessels are ligated, that there is no annulment of the death declaration and that the patient remains dead. Is there a permanent cessation of flow to the brain with ligation of the carotids and vertebrals? Presumably, there is no flow going to the brain through the major vessels. However, there are some known bypasses to the, the great vessels to the brain um, that could potentially um, bring blood flow to really important areas, um, areas that are most importantly involved with the level of arousal or wakefulness um, and, and thus could potentially lead to an unknown degree of existential or other, um, or other suffering. And how, 
in places where this is done, how are or are people monitoring for either blood flow or brain function uh, during this procedure? So unfortunately, this is highly variable and it depends on the countries. Um, I know that the European Transplant Society got together and put out a, a set of recommendations that recommended that brain flow should be monitored, but the modalities that they recommended, including NEARS technology, EEG, uh, BIS monitoring, may not be sensitive enough to detect what may be some residual flow to the brainstem. And in one case series of three patients, one of the surgeons involved in the cases noted um, that there was about a 50 ml per minute flow that was still detected from these vessels, and whether or not that's sufficient to, as Matt is saying, activate these areas that might lead to perceived suffering is unknown at this time. And maybe while we use the term suffering, the more important question is, or more important, important component of this is their potential experience of what's going on, whether it's suffering or not, the fact that someone might be able to perceive that their body is now being um, manipulated in order for organ uh, procurement. That's probably the more, uh, more disturbing question. And I think leads a little bit back towards what Alex was mentioning in terms of how some people in the lay public um, or even those who don't interface with uh, with brain death or DCD organ donation as regularly as, as we all do, um, this concept of how and why are we discussing this um, potential clamping of the, of the blood vessels that go towards the brain. Do either of you think that the ethical argument changes if you administer sedation and analgesia kind of empirically in case someone is experiencing? Some of this, I think, comes back to a, a concept that we, we skipped over a little bit, which um, comes to really the intent of, of what does irreversibility versus permanence mean when, when we define death. And, and in this situation, a lot of the arguments for one side or the other are intention-based. So if the intention for a family who has decided to move forward with a um, with a DCD organ donation is that their family member, their loved one, is going to be able to donate organs and support the lives of other um, people around the uh, around the country, their region, or around the world. That the intent, even after the declaration of death, if the heart is restarted um, and circulation is is restarted to the heart, that it doesn't matter what the, um, the, the concept of restarting uh, the heart is because the purpose of the cessation was in order to uh, provide these organs. And this really then starts to, to feed into this concept about the dead donor rule. Um, and when thinking about the dead donor rule, really this is an argument for how and why we can take organs from one person and place them in another. And, and in order to do this, uh, it is required that one, the, the patient must be declared deceased before procurement of vital organs for transplantation. And secondarily, that the act of organ procurement cannot occur before the death of the patient, such that the act of organ procurement would cause the death of the patient. So what you're suggesting by the dead donor rule then to clarify is that even if, for example, someone wants to die to give their organs, um, that might not necessarily be ethical or acceptable. Um, is that is that right? Yeah, you know, right now I don't think uh, we could say I'm a really healthy young person. Uh, my heart is excellent, but I know that my you know young child is in need of a heart and. I'm willing to give my life so they can take my heart in order to um, to do this, and and I think that's a it, it's a very flagrant um, description of of what we're talking about here. But but yes, that 
you cannot end one's life, someone's life in order to, um, to procure organs, even if that is the intent. At least that's how, um, how we have traditionally looked at organ donation. Whether or not NRP starts to alter that discussion in terms of consent for organ donation, that may be something that, that we're looking at in the future as to how we move forward with these, these organs. And in part, some of this becomes um, a question of the double effect principle, um, which is that when we're performing any intervention um, with the purpose of it being beneficial, sometimes it can lead to adverse um, or unintentional um, death that um, that's ethically and morally justifiable. So someone who's on hospice care that we are giving morphine to, it's going to reduce their respiratory rate. And while it's the primary indication for this is to ease their, uh, their air hunger, their respiratory distress, the unintended consequence is that they may die more rapidly. It's different when we're talking about um, the declaration of death becoming invalidated by ligating uh, the, the main vessels to the brain um, in order to then describe or declare brain death uh, for a patient to ethically um, procure their organs uh, afterwards, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I want to just go back to something that Rich mentioned, which is that uh, there are uh, several groups in Europe that are doing this. Is there any, and, and you, you seem to make it sound like there's not a set protocol necessarily about monitoring. Um, are any groups in the United States currently trying to use NRP? To my knowledge, the PANRP is something that is already happening um, all around the country. And to my knowledge, there is no plan at this time to monitor any sort of brain activity with any of the technologies that we already mentioned. So BIS, NEARS, or EEG. This um, procedure was uh, invented in the United Kingdom. Ultimately, because of the ongoing ethical conundrums that this is leading to, the UK has decided to pause. Um, Canada, similarly, um, initially rejected the concept of TANRP and formed a subcommittee, which was then investigating um, how they could incorporate potentially NRP into their transplantation protocols, um, has ultimately opted to pursue direct perfusion for now until there is um, a little bit more knowledge about what this collateral uh, perfusion means with regards to uh, brain flow and function. Um, and I know that other countries, for example, have just said no, such as Australia um, or Germany, which doesn't even do DCD at all. And it all, uh, part of it stems from um, the definitions of death in each of these countries. And these variations in the definition of death make TANRP more or less consistent with the persistent declaration of death, which then uh, makes it more acceptable or not. That's pretty concerning to me because I will say that until I heard about TANRP, you know, several months ago on the ethics committee, I had, I, I had never heard of it before. And it sounds like it's been going on in the United States. I wonder, have any of you had any experience with it at your institutions or have you, do you have colleagues who have had experience with it? So I can speak about our, our local experience here. So um, same as you, Alex, when we heard about NRP, I brought this up to both our ethics committee in addition to our local organ procurement organization. And uh, what I learned is that the OPO had attempted to do a case in August of 2022, um, but it didn't end up going through because the patients did not die in the pre-specified amount of time. Um, because of the concerns that we raised, the practice is currently on hold until there's further revision. Um, but it was certainly interesting to find out that um, this is already happening in a lot of places. A lot of um, organ procurement organizations I've heard are even pushing other centers to say, hey, this is already happening in such and such center. Um, it's been vetted by our boards and our ethics boards and our um, legal teams. And so we don't need the institution's permission to proceed with this. Uh, the patient is declared 
And so we can just proceed with it without your involvement or consent. And I think that that's also very concerning. Yeah, I think it's one thing to obtain consent from the family. And I think, at least to me, that sounds like a no brainer that the family needs to be told what happens after the declaration of death. Um, but I also wonder how comfortable intensivists would feel being a participant in, in this sort of procedure. You know, I, I recently did a DCD and they sort of tell you that after the five minutes of, of no cardiac activity, your your part is done. But I would find it uncomfortable, I think, to see TANRP brought into the operating room sort of without being vetted by an institutional ethics board first. I think that one of the um, one of the arguments that's made by uh, folks who are pro TANRP is that the difference between a uh, patient who is undergoing a DCD um, organ procurement versus a TANRP organ procurement is the same. That the declaration of death occurs before the um, before they they begin their procurement procedure, and that. Um, in these cases, essentially, the um, the physicians who are determining death are are already have completed their their component of the of the patient's um, of the patient's declaration, and thus the the procurement is exactly the same in um, in that concept. And so there isn't really a need to discuss this differently than you would discuss DCD with the with a patient's family. Um, I also would say that you know when we talked about this um, concept of, of NRP during the ethics committee. This was the first time that I had heard about it and very quickly started hearing more and more stories about NRP being instituted or, um, or at least talked about uh, in, the, in, in our communities. Um, here at Hartford, um, we have a really great relationship with our OPO, uh, New England Donor Services, and in discussions with our liaisons um, with their group, um, we have been told that while it's being discussed, at least for now, they're only discussing using abdominal uh, NRP, which which forgoes the need to um, restart the heart and circulation. And so there are some um, some groups that are, are starting to think about how can we utilize these processes um, in a very effective way and um, in addition, be able to optimize organ procurement um, throughout our area. Do we think that as neurointensivists, we have um, either expertise or maybe even an obligation to be a part of the conversation about neuromonitoring in TANRP? I think that it comes down to whether or not you are in agreement with the declaration of death in this particular case and whether or not the restarting of circulation violates the prior declaration. In that if you don't feel that death has been declared, you'd be very concerned about the possibility that there could be some degree of awareness or potential arousal um, for, for people who have recirculated blood. However, if you feel that the declaration of death has been completed, then there isn't a, a viable reason to believe that you should be monitoring uh, the patient's brain because they're, they're deceased. And I think that as neurologists, we're in a unique situation compared to other intensivists just because our brain is our primary organ of interest. And, and having an understanding of its circulation and its perfusion gives us a better idea that we don't know all of it and that even this low amount of collateralization might be enough. Well, we don't know what that what that means. And I think that if anybody has a good understanding of it, it's going to be the neurocritical care teams. We probably have a, a really intriguing um, or interesting viewpoint on all of this as well, because we are actively always thinking about uh, patient outcomes and what it means to have a good neurologic recovery and what it means to have a poor neurologic recovery with varying degrees of disorders of consciousness, um, which forces us to really think about what does what does 
brain function actually mean? Um, and so I think that that puts us in a in a different category of uh, of folks to be thinking about this particular aspect of of life and death, and and really to think about how are we defining death, which is so apropos that we're going through the UDDA revisions at the same time. Well, Matt, I think you did a great job of attempting to answer the philosophical question of what is death, and I dare you to also answer the question of what is consciousness. Perhaps the two of those things can be combined in a, a statement about what we think is happening during TANRP. That's probably a better uh, answer for a, a totally separate Hot Topics uh, podcast. So I think we've talked about a lot of the concerns surrounding this procedure, but I do want to bring it back to what Rich had talked about at the beginning, which is that there does seem to be an improvement in the quality of the hearts that are being procured using TANRP. And I wonder if you, Matt and Rich, have any last thoughts about how we might pursue this in the United States in a way that uh, maintains public trust in us as a medical community, while also trying to optimize the availability of hearts for everyone on the waiting list. And so what I, I would start by saying is that you're you're right? Some of the data is currently supports that the outcomes after TA NRP heart transplants are equivocal to those of uh, brain dead donors. Um, and the other important thing that I would point out is that that of outcome. So ultimately, this patient is so devastated medically that they're not coming back, and the family has made the difficult decision to donate these organs. And the ultimate outcome for this patient is death. And so in this process, which by costing substantially less than the direct procurement method um, would lead to increased uptake um, worldwide and increase the, uh, the, available, uh, the availability of hearts and also increase access and equity uh, for heart transplants, we really have to consider this technology and think about how we do it right. And I think part of that process involves looking at it more carefully and potentially doing more research to investigate what this collateralized brain flow means um, and potentially also discussing with our legal um, colleagues the regards of uh, whether or not these patients are in fact in a state of permanent death when they're initially declared or not. I agree with Rich entirely. And I, I think there's more options out there that exist for um, the potential benefit of patients who are suffering with failing organs. You know, we've recently seen some successes in the world of xenotransplantation um, from my former institution at the University of Maryland. But the, um, the big concept here, I think that we've all been alluding to um, throughout this, which makes things a little bit more concerning, is the ethical component. And as long as we are very clear about how we move this process forward and think very carefully about the, um, the unintended consequences of moving forward with TANRP, um, I, I think we are in a really good place to, to help a lot of additional patients. And as Rich said, I, probably working with our, our ethics groups and our legal um, teams in, the, um, in our own local institutions, we can come to more appropriate agreements for how to, um, to move forward with this, whether or not that means uh, in instituting a consent form um, where the family knows what what we're moving forward with and whether or not we're going to work with, um, as Alex had mentioned, the possibility of anesthetizing patients during the procedure versus just observing their um, cerebral um, flow during, um, during that time. These are all possible options and, and really just need to be thought about very clearly. Well, Matt and Rich, thank you so much for taking the time. And I hope people enjoy this conversation that we've had. And I'm hoping that 
all members of NCS continue to sort of ask their local institutions about TANRP so that we can increase transparency about the whole process. Thanks for listening.